Welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Alec Cooley. I'm a senior advisor here with Bush Systems and I'll be your moderator for today as I am for all of our um, Green Thinking webinar series. Uh, we, we put these programs on roughly once or every other month on a range of different topics, all, all, all tying in back in some fashion to waste reduction and recycling programs for, for institutional settings. Um, so we welcome you to today's program. Our topic today is gonna to be um, implementing centralized waste collections. And as the title implies, we're gonna be exploring this model for managing recycling and waste from office settings. Um, and we're gonna be doing that with two different case studies, uh, a public sector as well as a private sector. And we'll jump in in a moment to give a little more context and a background for the program. But, but first I want to introduce our two panelists who are joining us today. We are first joined by uh, Joni Burns, who is an environment, health, and safety and sustainability manager with the biotech company Amgen. She has three decades of environmental policy and planning experience, working with a wide range of public and private sector organizations in the U.S. and internationally. Joni has developed waste and is, has developed waste reduction and recycling and composting programs for public sector agencies and institutions um, and businesses with aggressive sustainability goals. In her current position, she is responsible for waste and materials management at Amgen's headquarters in Thousand Oaks, California. Joni holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Protection from the Institute of Technology in Sligo, Ireland. Um, I hope I got that right. Uh, as well as an MBA with an emphasis on sustainable business from California Lutheran University. She is also a certified sustainable resource manager and a true advisor. Uh, we're, so we'll start off with uh, Joni as our first presenter in a, in a few minutes, and then uh, we'll be following her with Rain Barber, who is a sustainability engineer with the Waste and Environment Department at the City of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. She graduated from the University of Alberta with a degree in civil engineering and a focus on structural and geotechnical engineering. Rain previously worked in the consulting world before transitioning to her current role at the City of Lethbridge. Rain's work at the city primarily consists of sustainability projects, including circular economy initiatives and projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. She is particularly interested in waste reduction, climate change mitigation, and community climate adaptation. She has a deep love for music and the environment, and along with myself and many others, um, uh, as, and also um, relaxing with friends and family. So um, we look forward to Joni and Rain's presentations in a few minutes. Before we get started, um, just want to remind folks that uh, you know, we're always limited with uh, this format uh, without the ability to interact verbally with with the audience, but we do uh, want this to be as uh, interactive as possible. So we encourage you to use the Zoom functionality, uh, both the chat and the Q&A. And, and again, just to make the distinction, uh, if you have specific questions that you would like to hear addressed by our panelists on the program, put those into the Q&A function on your dashboard. If you just want to chat, share items back and forth, um, go ahead and put those into the chat function separately. Um, and we do encourage that. Um, you know, if you have examples of things that you're doing at your facility, um, if you want to riff off an idea, something that's been presented by one of the our speakers and, and give an example of what you've done, that's all fantastic. Um, I encourage you to share those um, and get some discussion going in the chat. So uh, just, just keep that clear that if you have something you actually want addressed by the speakers, make sure it goes into the Q&A function. So um, to, uh, to, before I hand it over, let me do a couple, um, just take a minute just to sort of set up this topic and, and uh, what we're trying to do with this program. Um, for um, many of you, if you're not familiar with centralized collection programs, the, the, the basic idea of this is trying to, it, it's, it's one aspect of how you take a program that uh, waste collection program that really was designed with a legacy arrangement of trying to make uh, make trash collection more convenient. Um, and if you follow the pattern of how many of, of our institutional collection programs evolve over time, oftentimes what you have is this legacy waste trash collection program, and then you graft recycling in a sense onto that. Um, and it tends to develop in a very ad hoc fashion. As, as you get resources, you buy some new bins, you stick them out for recycling, uh, but you're not necessarily changing and reevaluating how that system works. Um, and as a result, most programs in that context tend to hit a plateau after a while. You, you may get many recycling bins out there, but you find that you still have this stubborn, you're not able to get past 40 or 50% uh, recovery material. 
Uh, in many cases, that comes down to the fact that these programs, the way they've evolved over time, are not don't really take behavior into um, into consideration. They're not designed to really encourage people to recycle, and in many ways, they create structural barriers. Uh, you know, just th this photo you have up here, just showing some examples of how that works. You you have um, individual trash bins that are still left by themselves. They don't have a recycling bin placed next to them. Or you might have this ad hoc different generations of bins that have been purchased at different times, but they look different. There's no real relationship to them. Um, and it creates this confusing hodgepodge. Um, and then you also tend to have on the hey, service Alex, side. I, yes. I, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think I'm not seeing any slides where you uh, mentioned this photo. So I thought I would mention that. Well, I appreciate you raising that. <laughs> Double check that I've got my- I think I'm not alone. There, give me one second. Here we go. There you go. Great, thanks for uh, for the, the prompt there. Um, so as, as I was saying here, what you see here are um, just examples of what I would call this legacy arrangement where you tend to have just bins that are placed by themselves um, uh, or the hodgepodge, different types of bins, where you have the custodial service that in many ways still provides Sort of this concierge level of of collection for trash but recycling maybe is included um, maybe it isn't um, but it's making waste very ultra convenient um, it's taking out to a very decentralized type of model um, and this tends to create these barriers with folks um, assuming that they're paying a lot of attention and focus but in many cases they're not and so what you need is a system that is going to help to guide um, their participation, and that's how we professionalize and improve programs over time. Um, I, I think a good analogy for for how I think of this is similar to traffic management. Um, you know, traditionally in the past we built roads, made them smooth and convenient for cars to drive on, but we still have to deal with the human uh, behavior, um, and and you can't just assume that people are conscientious, that they're always paying attention, that they're always engaged. Um, and so what we've learned in recent years is how to design the infrastructure, the road system, to actually guide behavior, um, to encourage folks to do what you want them to do. And we do that with traffic calming in the instance of, of, uh, of uh, traffic management, and that leads to better results. We have fewer traffic accidents um, and, and a safer system in general. That same approach can be taken to optimizing uh, waste and recycling collections to get higher recovery of materials, get cleaner materials. And we do that by how we design that infrastructure. Um, different examples of, of ways that you could do this are with coming up with a more of a streamlined standardized system of uh, with uh, the same color branding for different types of bins. Um, and this, this example we're going to be focusing on today with centralized collection is really, in my mind, the other big significant way that we can do that in office settings. Um, and, and what it comes down to is the idea that you don't necessarily need to have custodial service emptying bins at every single decentralized one of these locations that, that, um, that creates both a lot of work for custodians, but it also takes some of that responsibility off of individuals. And we've seen many times over and over again, when you give that responsibility back to folks, that can help to um, make systems more conscientious, it gets people more engaged and can improve the collections overall. Um, so we'll leave it at that, um, but that's my basic setup. And we're gonna be hearing more about this with the two case studies that we have coming up. So with that, let me hand it over to Joni Burns and she's gonna start off telling us what she's doing with Amgen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we were, I was going to keep my, my video on just so you could see me, but I, I'm kind of glitching out a little bit. So I'm going to go off, go ahead and turn off my camera just to save some um, bandwidth if I can. I don't know if I can now. My little bar went. Maybe I'll have to leave it on. Okay. Um, so as Alec mentioned, I'm with Amgen. Uh, we are an independent biotech company based here in Thousand Oaks. This is right behind our campus was what you see in my background. Um, we started in 1980 and have since grown um, significantly. We have a presence in over 100 companies uh, or countries. And uh, with the recent acquisition of a, a company called Horizon Therapeutics, we have over 30 um, products on the market. Um, and we, we do have a long history of being a leader in um, all things ESG, not just only sustainability, but um, specifically with sustainability, you'll, you'll see in my next slide that we've, we are not new to the game. 
Um, and we, we have a, a good reputation in the industry and beyond. We're listed on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index um, going on um, nine years, I think now. So, um, so with that, um, where we have been on our journey, uh, let me see if I can get it to advance. There we go. So like I say, we've been at it for a while um, and we've had several kind of rounds of environmental commitments to make goals towards improving our environmental performance. Um, that last set of goals ended, if you will, in 2020. Uh, we met or, or exceeded our ambitions with a 30 reduction in water. We reduced our carbon by 33% and our waste um, by 28%. And that launched our 2027 ambition, um, which is also known as the road to net zero and it is Im ambitious. Um, the, the due date, if you will, is 2027, and that includes being carbon neutral for scope one and scope two emissions. And I think if you're familiar with a lot of the companies or countries or other entities that are setting their, their carbon neutrality goals, they typically go to something like 2030 or even 2050. So it really is um, you know, really aggressive. Um, on that front. And then a 40% reduction in, in water use and a 75% reduction in waste disposed. And that includes zero waste um, where possible, where feasible at, at individual sites. Um, so we went to centralized collection a long time ago. I joined Amgen in 2016. So this absolutely predates me. Um, and um, at the time it was called TCFs or trash can free, uh, was the original, um, name for it. It's turned, it's, it changed to TFZs, trash free zones. Um, but the goals were, you know, reducing waste going to landfill largely by increasing staff awareness and, and really making it easier in a lot of, of regards. It's absolutely a big part of it was saving money. And I'll show you some data um, that backs that up. Um, and then there's a reputational aspect to it of just, you know, this is the right thing to do. And it's not only um, for our external reputation, but to let our staff know that, you know, this is a priority for us and we want to do things right. Um, really important is that this was a big effort that very largely involved our, what we call ISPs, integrated service providers. We do have um, our own facilities management team that is internal to Amgen, but we have a third-party facilities management company. They were hugely involved. Um, of course, we have third-party environmental services or you know, custodial, janitorial, choose your term. Absolutely, they were part of it. And I'm not saying just with the implementation, they were a huge part in, in really driving it in, helping build the program and helping design it and thinking about all the things I'm going to be telling you about and planning it out and really championing the program because this, you know, this was a benefit to them. You know, as I mentioned, a big part of this is things like savings on labor um, and, and making things easier for everyone involved. Um, so the original scope was to eliminate those individual office and cubicle trash and recycling collection locations in place containers at centralized locations. The um, thinking was around 25 people per centralized collection location. That's really going to depend on your specific situation, how many people you feel like, you know, people per station, if you will, you know, and, and that actually changed. I'll, I'll speak to this in a minute as the program was rolled out. Everyone got this cute little mini garbage can on the right just to acknowledge that if you've got, you know, a gum wrapper or an apple core, you know, if you just want to have a small can at your desk that you are expected to empty every day, you know, that's, that's fine. And then, you know, if you think back to the early 2000s, we were still separately collecting paper and we were being paid for it. It was a revenue stream to us, for us. And um, it was a really elegant collection container and it was cardboard boxes. We actually did maintain those but change the expectation that individuals were responsible for emptying those or putting them, if they were in a closed office, putting them outside their office door so that they could be emptied bi-weekly. So that, you know, we did maintain some desk side and, and you also have to think about that time frame. There was a heck of a lot more still paper being generated than um, in today's largely paperless office settings. Um, it was a phased rollout. There were pilots at a couple of sites. I'll show you some data on that. Hugely important, kind of work out the bugs, you know, make, make sure you can make this work. And then it was a phase rollout from there in terms of um, the number of sites. You know, as I mentioned, we're very much a global com 
company now. This was a North America program. Um, we started at four sites and then and the phase two was implementing it at all North America sites following what was called, you know, janitorial vendor due diligence. And that's basically just making sure they could make it work. Um, it, we are essentially for, um, you know, most, most, if not all Amgen locations globally are now um, this kind of a model because we've moved to what's what's called the the next gen or office of the future setting where it, it, we've got big open offices. There are no individual offices in most of our work locations. Um, so this is one of the, an example of the pilot. This is at the Thousand Oaks site and it was in just one building, building 22. The, you know, as planned, the, the desk side trash and, and commingle recycling was removed. The paper boxes, the cardboard boxes for paper were maintained. It was only 75 employees at these four locations within the building. Um, and they got that little mini trash can, but they also got a lot more. And this is a really important part of this. And that's the communication element. There was little thank you notes. Uh, there was a map showing people. I mean, this wasn't a big building, but really going out of your way to say, hey, we want, we want to make sure you know how this works. We want to give you the information so you know there's a place where you can take your material and it's right around the corner. Um, a brochure explaining... Um, the, the program and ultimately every site, um, all four sites developed their own set of FAQs based on either questions they were getting or questions they were anticipating. That's a huge aspect of this. Again, you just wanna give everyone the tools and information up front um, to gain that buy-in. Um, and then we did, you know, a cute little trash, uh, you know, it was, again, it was still at that time, the TCF, you know, this is, hey, this is a trash can free zone to kind of give, give the people who are participating in the pilot that that badge of honor to say you know we're, we're trying this out and as you can see on the right you know if you look at at the metrics there were there were numerous waste audits done throughout before and during um, the rollout and you'll see the amount of recyclables ending up in the trash can just plummeted over a very short period of time and as you'll see in the next slide that really helped make the business case because audits were done in all 34 buildings that were on our campus at the time. And as you'll see, there were huge, it says you know, nearly 30% was the average, but you'll see some of our buildings had almost half, half of the, the waste, the quote unquote waste stream was actually recyclable. Whereas at that one building, 22, where we had a pilot only running in part of the building, brought that number down to 8%. And so those numbers, you know, speak volumes. And you'll hear, you know, as I talk about lessons learned, you know, this is really an important part is, is gaining the buy-in, um, you know, showing people how this can work and the benefits you'll achieve. Another huge important factor, like I mentioned, was cost savings. And remember, these are 2009 figures. Mind you, they're bigger sites, you know, some of, you know, the, the Thousand Oaks site was 34 buildings. And so, you know, it's still, you know, well over a quarter of a million dollars at 2009 um, dollars. Um, that's a huge cost savings. And, you know, the, the Colorado figures, as you see in the footnote, are actually based on real numbers. Colorado is where the, the, um, the pilot was also run. And that was based on actual cost savings they were experiencing. So, you know, again, this just speaks volumes and really helps to make that, that true business case. So we rolled it out in phases. Uh, you'll see phase one was the blue buildings, phase two was the green buildings, and then phase three was the yellow buildings. And that was largely to help not only um, the, the custodial staff kind of change their routines, but to, you know, make sure that that communication piece, that all important communication piece could continue, that there could be a lot of targeted, you know, what we call hyper care to make sure that, um, you know, as we rolled this out, people were getting on board. And, you know, I'm going to be a little sarcastic, but, you know, there was absolutely the people who, no matter how much communication that we put out saying, you know, this is coming, it was, wait a minute, what are you guys doing? You know, are you kidding me? And then, you know, you would have the person that would say, oh, I don't know, I, you know, I kind of like it. And, and this is sarcasm again. I mean, they're really, um, what you're seeing here is a lot of the vocal mind minority. Um, the pe most people, you know, maybe weren't out there kind of, you know, singing the song and dancing the dance for this, but they were fine with it. It was absolutely just fine. Um, and you just have to stay the course. You can't let those strong vocal people, um, you know, kind of dominate the conversation. So 
Um, with that, I want to kind of show you how this has evolved through the years. And I love that Alec um, talked about that ad hoc <laughs> recycling and, and waste collection system. A lot of times we did just retrofit or we had existing kind of built in infrastructure that we retrofitted. Um, and then, but, but this is kind of what our TFZs look like in the early days. This is the signage on the right. Uh, in my humble opinion, it's a lot of words and the pictures are pretty small. It was, it was before me, but um, it was fairly effective. And as the program matured, this is what it looked like. And again, remember, we did have separate paper collections. So that green bin is not actually compost as we, we might think today. But back, you know, in the, in the early 2010s, this was paper was blue, trash or landfill was the, the, the gray or the black. And then the green was the commingle recycling. Um, and then what I did when I came to Amgen was saying, said, let's get rid of that separate paper collection because we were no longer being paid for the revenue stream. Um, it really wasn't necessary. It would save an enormous, and I don't have the data here on that, but once again, it made a huge, I made a business case by just the number of liners and, and labor saved by not having that separate collection stream. But it also gave me those green bins back um, to allow me for my future vision of post-consumer or front of house uh, composting. I did move to a more of the recycle across America format for the, the signage, as you see on the right, still very, very busy. That was based on feedback from people who said, you know, I need more details. Um, I have since achieved my goal of bringing on post-consumer compost and have fully adopted that kind of recycle across America format. Pretty simple. Um, signage with big visuals of the key things you want in each waste stream. Um, this is a this is an example of a TFC that's located at the end of a wing of one of our buildings and, and around the corner is where the recycling is. We're taking advantage of existing infrastructure there, not ideal, but again, very centralized and that's in a break room. Um, one of the things I will mention, going back to that initial rollout, um, the original plan based on that 25 um, people per trash free zone that the math didn't work out when the original plan was just to put these in break rooms, nor did it work out um, in terms of really making it relatively convenient for people. Some people's offices were actually quite a distance from the, no the closest break room. And it didn't really allow for, you know, it, you've got to kind of hit that sweet spot. And that I would say is one of the, the most difficult aspects of these types of programs is how do you get the balance right? How do you make it convenient for people, but not having hands everywhere. You know, what loc you know, what is the best location? Is it in the break room? Well, yeah, you probably should have some waste containers there, but what are the other locations that are going to be the most effective and the most, you know, truly centralized for people? So that's a big factor. And then I just want to kind of wrap up with, uh, I think Alec <laughs> shared this tip with, or this term, the pro tips. So I've, I've already mentioned that, you know, the, the data is hugely, hugely helpful and, and really necessary in making your business case. Money talks and data tells the story. So really, it's worth making the investment up front to do the homework so that when you go to, to sell this program, you have the answers. And with that, I mean, I mean, you know, anticipate the questions, anticipate the opposition, anticipate every reason why people will tell you this isn't going to work and be ready to counter it. You know, that second point under that, that um, column on the left about making a strong business case um, by, by talking about all the benefits. One of the, I mentioned is health and wellness. There was just a recent study by Columbia university that said in order to counter um, the negative effects of a sedentary lifestyle of where, how we as a society have changed from, you know, working in fields to sitting at desks is you have to move for five minutes out of every 30 minutes. This is getting people out of their desks. We have a very, very strong ergonomics program and overall wellness program at Amgen. And this, this fits right in. It takes a village. I've mentioned you need to get your service providers in and engage, but also anyone and everyone that can really help you um, whether they need to be involved or they can just be there as a champion and a supporter. Um, and that might even include the people who are the doubters, uh, you know, those having those voices early on, like I said, to kind of anticipate 
where the opposition or the arguments against are going to be so that you can come prepared with answers. And then obviously leadership support is, is crucial. The higher up you go, that will, will support you when you do have that vocal minority, the better. I was just down at um, USC, uh, you know, effectively a city, this, the size of that campus is massive and they're rolling this out and their president has said, we are going to be zero waste. There's, you know, she is supporting this. Um, 100%. And that's just a huge, valuable tool for the team that has to implement it. And then, you know, obviously change is hard. I've mentioned this a few times, really anticipate anything and everything that, that could go wrong or any barriers that could be put up. Um, don't let the vocal minority dominate the conversation and, and do as much as you can to just communicate, to really let people know this is why we're doing it. Here are the benefits. And, you know, we want your help. We want you to be on board. Um, and then I'll change or I'll, I'll end with a little bit of cynicism. <laughs> so this is January of 2023. And um, these three, it's small, you can't really see, but the three offices are all right next to each other. And I think what happened is someone started this. They found a trash can. They keep it in their office and then they were leaving it outside uh, for our environmental services people to empty and they emptied it for a while obviously because other people caught on and so I, I had to kind of step in and stop that and say wait a minute not part of your contract you're encouraging you know bad behavior and you know we went and spoke to these individuals in these offices and said that's just not how things work here um, overall I will say you know like I say I joined Amgen in 2016 this is just the way it was and this is you know it it's not a big deal at all. It's just the way the campus is set up. And like I, I mentioned with our more open office planning um, or, or layout, you know, it, it just absolutely makes sense anyways. So, you know, people have to learn change can be hard, but ultimately it just becomes kind of the norm. So with that, I think that's my last slide. And oh, I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to you, Alec. Great, thank you, Joni. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you guys have a great story to tell there, um, uh, and, and definitely um, your your very last point there, I think is pretty universal from my experience. Wherever I've seen this type of model put into place, there inevitably is going to be uh, at least a few people who have pushed back. They see this as you know ha having them take responsibility for something that's supposed to be somebody else's job, um, and, and that's part of, as you pointed out, it's about change, um, and people don't like change, but. Um, in the vast majority of cases, almost universally, of, of the dozens and dozens of organizations, colleges, universities, corporations that have done this, if following the, the points that you're making about having an effective communication strategy, um, that can almost always be overcome. And people, at the end of the day, they adapt, and it just becomes the new normal. Uh, but it is about getting past that initial stage and, and making sure you've got that strategy up front is, is a real key piece of that. So. Um, good. Before we go on to the next quest, or before we go on to Rain's presentation, let's let's go ahead and do a live poll if we can pull this up on the screen. Um, and the the question is uh, from everybody out there: What what best describes your collection arrangements? Um, are your custodians are they emptying just the trash? Are they doing just the recycling? Are they doing both? None at all or other? Um, and again, here's a great opportunity to throw questions in or or throw. Uh, comments into the chat if there's some uh, different approach that you're taking at your facility. Um, and while we're waiting for responses to come in, um, we had a couple of questions come in. Uh, Joni, um, um, one I'd, I'd throw out there first from uh, Tim was was asking, what was the lead time before you actually rolled out the actual program? So from the pilot and then did you do this in phases? Did um, I know this is before your time, but how did that rollout look? So it was, um, you know, if you want to really talk about the overall planning, it was over a year in the works to plan. But then in terms of the actual rollout, the, the, the first pilot was about four months. The second pilot, the first pilot continued while the second pilot came in, and that was about three more months. And, and again, that first pilot was at our big, big site, and that's why they continued it longer. And so it was about seven months of really all the piloting, looking at the... Um, the the change in in waste characteristics and and recycling behavior and then that full rollout you know I, that slide you know for my site again 34 buildings at the time time that was relatively quick i mean it was really just over the course of of a month 
that they got it into the different buildings. And again, they did um, phase that mostly with the with the idea of um, you know making sure that they could do the communication and just it. it I mean, it's, it's a huge effort to do. They just it it, it took staff to do it. Does that it, answer the? Question? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and obviously you want to be able to focus and really be able to do it right with each sort of phase and not try and spread yourself too thin all at one time. I, yeah, that makes right. sense. Uh, and another quick question um, that I had, um, you were referring to cost savings a while back. Um, just to clarify, what did that constitute? Was that just avoided hauler fees for lower waste or were there other aspects that went in that, that calculated to that cost savings? Yeah, I mean, the, the figures that I shared were strictly the labor savings because of okay. the reduced effort. I mean, it was it, it cut the time that it took to service buildings in some cases well in half or beyond half the time. Wow. Um, but the other th the numbers I didn't share um, because I actually didn't have them for this. And, and I should have shared what I, I did for my movement to the two or my move from three bin to two bin is just the liner costs alone, the number of bag liners in each of those containers that, you know, a lot of times the, the custodians, they, they can't, you know, empty just the liner and leave it there. So they're, they're pulling these liners and a lot of times they're half, maybe half full. Um, so that's a huge cost, especially when you do have a program like today with my three bin system, you know, the liners that we use in those bins are very expensive. And so to the extent that you don't have to have numerous you know because our compost bins are really the post-consumer compost bins are not at every place where we have a trash free zone because some people eating you know in laboratory buildings or near near next to their lab those compost bins are only where there's um like a, a break room so that made that made it makes a big difference in cost right there yeah I, i've seen examples of universities um saving twenty thirty thousand dollars a year just on the the, the bag liners themselves when you yep. go to uh, eliminating the, the desk side bin or, or going to just using the mini bin style. Um, right. Yeah, great. So let's, um, if we can publish the live results, um, looks like here we have um, about 16% you know, custodial is just handling waste service only. Um, interestingly, there's nobody who is who has custodians handling recycling only, which is, is, a, is more rare, but um, it looks like most folks here are um, custodians are doing both recycling and the trash about 59% there. So, um, so it's interesting to see how this, how this plays out. Um, uh, but only 16% actually have the centralized program or, or the centralized model in place currently. So great. So with that, why don't we go ahead and move on to our next presenter. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Rain Barber, who is a sustainability engineer with the city of Lethbridge. And Rain, you can go ahead and turn on your your uh, camera, and I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending where you are. I am a sustainability engineer with the city of Lethbridge, and my role within the organization is to progress our sustainability and climate goals. My role is technically within our waste and environment department, so I did help with the rollout of a centralized waste collection system in our municipal buildings. So Lethbridge is located in Southern Alberta and has a population of around 100,000 people. We are home to an absolutely beautiful river valley, a prairie landscape with tons of agricultural opportunities and some very unique native plants. And of course, the high level bridge, this is kind of our staple. We are lucky enough to call the lands of the Blackfoot people our home. And it's very important that we recognize and respect Blackfoot knowledge, cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. Respecting the land that we live on and the environment that we depend on is critical to our well being and our future. I would also like to acknowledge that the city of Lethbridge is home to the Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. 
So we more recently transitioned to a centralized collection. So I will be detailing a bit more of the steps that the city took to introduce this system to our facilities and all of the education that went along with it. And ultimately, I will be speaking to the many benefits associated with the centralized waste systems and will answer any questions following the presentation. So I have quite a bit to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in. The non-residential sectors in Lethbridge generate around 85% of the total waste going to our landfill. So this makes the ICI and C&D sectors key players in waste diversion and waste reduction in our city. So the city of Lethbridge has a 2030 business waste reduction target of 45% below the 2013 baseline. And as you can see by the graphic on the screen here, we have met our 20. 21 target, but we still have some work to do before 2030. Waste diversion is also directly linked to our climate targets. So the city of Lethbridge has a 40% reduction target for corporate greenhouse gas emissions from the 2018 baseline also by 2030. So Environment and Climate Change Canada estimates that food and or other organics represent about 30% of the waste that Canadians send for disposal every year. And diverting food and other organic waste from the landfill helps reduce the amount of methane produced by landfill operations and will help us reach our climate corporate goals. So one of our key diversion techniques is the updated waste bylaw. So the updated waste bylaw requires businesses and organizations in the ICI and C&D sectors to comply with mandatory recycling and organics, which means they have to provide employees, visitors, and contractors with access to recycling and organics with equal convenience to garbage. And that's very key wording. We don't want just one recycling bin in the whole facility. It has to be equally convenient to garbage. There are over 2,900 businesses in Lethbridge and all of these businesses fall under this mandatory recycling and organics provisions of our updated waste bylaw. I also want to just take a second to shout out my colleague Felipe who's on the line because he is the brains and the brawn behind this mandatory program. Since full implementation earlier this year, uh, Felipe and his team have done so many presentations and have personally visited over 600 businesses in our, in our community just to describe the program requirements. And that was in addition to all of the typical social media outlets, newspapers, TV, and physical brochures. A common question that we get about the waste bylaw um, if I can change the slide, maybe, thank you, is around enforcement. So officially beginning in September of this year, a $50 per ton surcharge is applied to the entire load making its way to the landfill if more than 25% of this load contains designated materials. So that's all of the materials that are listed in the blue and the green portion of the screen here. So the city of Lethbridge falls within the purview of this mandatory program. Alec, do you mind clicking the next slide for me? Thank you. Um, so it's important that the city and our employees walk the talk and demonstrate that first and foremost, that compliance with the bylaw is easy. It's important to help us meet our waste reduction targets and also helps reduce the impact of our operations on the environment. So we have facilities that range from cemeteries to arenas to treatment plants, the landfill, the airport, all of these facilities have to comply with this updated waste bylaw. So over the past few years, we've equipped 45 of our facilities with centralized collection. Next slide, thank you. So how do we get from providing only the easy access garbage to this four stream waste collection system? Next slide. Prior to 2018, all of our facilities had garbage bins, obviously, but a dedicated recycling bin was not necessarily guaranteed. We had paper and cardboard recycling in place since the late 
1980s, but certain employees had to put in that extra effort to actually recycle the plastics and the metals. So we had our curbside recycling program coming to Lethbridge residents in 2019. So we thought it was an excellent opportunity to introduce mixed recycling to our city employees. So the first step of this was to have a pilot program. And the pilot program is helpful because it allows an opportunity to test some communication and education methods prior to the full rollout. So we selected three different facilities to be a part of the pilot program, and they were mainly selected because they had a diverse demographic of employees using the space. So it wasn't just office employees, it wasn't just operations staff, it was a little bit of both. And they also had recycling captains. So Mixed recycling was not yet incorporated into our overall caretaking contract. So we had recycling captains who were responsible for managing the recycling bins. So they emptied and cleaned the bins. They performed visual audits on the contents of the recycling bins. They helped with education and they also set out the blue card for pickup. Next slide. During the pilot program, we tested various different communication methods, including um, meetings with teams, we had emails, we had physical documentation and brochures given to people, and then just face-to-face -face conversations. We found that the face-to-face -face conversations were most effective because it allowed for just an open conversation and allowed people to ask questions that maybe they weren't comfortable asking in a larger group setting. We conducted 65 visual audits during the pilot, which gave us data on the fullness of the bins as well as the contents inside. And then we posted these learning boards, we called them, near the waste stations that were specifically aimed at mitigating the frequency of the most likely contaminants, which at the time we found were plastic film and paper towels. We saw specific benefits with standardized signage and standardized waste bins, including the color of the bins across all of the facilities so that people were familiar with the ins and outs of the program, regardless of where they were working that day. And also the alignment with the residential curbside collection definitely helped for program understanding. So this information uh, was used to help guide our corporate um, full rollout. So next slide. The program was then expanded to 30 additional facilities. So each facility got this three stream waste system and we had them strategically located in our lunchrooms or coffee areas where most of the material could be diverted. Um, luckily our lunchrooms and coffee areas are pretty convenient for all of our facilities. So people um, had easy access. And then we also included the blue carts, sorry, within our printer rooms to help divert some of the recycling and uh, mainly paper waste. This same bin system was rolled out to all of the different facilities to help with consistency, as many of the facilities had different programs in place. So this just kind of standardized everything all in one go. And at the time of full implementation, we did still utilize our recycling captains to move the contents from inside the facility outside for pickup. And then our internal waste and recycling operations team would pick up this blue cart on a weekly basis. Um, the costs associated for the program are just distributed through our interdepartmental system. Next slide. So we have corporate recycling fully implemented by the end of 2019. And the next step was to include the organics program. So this would help uh, achieve our waste diversion goals, will help our corporate environmental footprint. And we are hoping that our model can be used for other businesses in the ICI sector in our community. So first and foremost, let's just talk briefly about the business case. Next slide. So during and prior to implementation of our recycling program, we would conduct waste audits to better understand the composition of our local waste. So in 2017, we did an audit specifically for City Hall, and we found that 40% of the waste landfilled could actually be diverted. And of this, 37% of the total weight was attributed to organics. Further, the tipping rate at our waste and recycling center differs for what material 
you're disposing of. So general waste has a tipping rate of $115 per ton, whereas recyclables are substantially less at 10 to 75 to dollars per ton depending on the material and then the source separated organics is at sixty dollars per ton the bylaw surcharges are also a financial burden if they're not considered so ultimately diverting materials from the garbage stream allows for economic savings also waste bins in each of our offices were emptied daily, despite observational data indicating that most of the bins were far from full. So we even had video footage from one of our outdoor garbage bins at City Hall. And the footage indicated that the bin was maybe 25% full each time it was picked up. So I will come back to that later. Next slide. We began our organics pilot program pretty much immediately after the recycling program was implemented. We chose five facility in the organics program and each were provided the organics bin to complement the centralized station as well as paper towel only bins for the washroom. At this point, we did have separate contracts for the caretaking as well as the hauling. We didn't have our personal internal organics trucks yet, so we did have a separate contract for that. And then we bolted on our caretaking contract because it was just the prices to integrate the organic scope into our existing contract were just very large at the time. And then our caretaking staff would also audit the, the bins visually to help aid in our communication efforts. Next slide. So the program was intended to run for one year, but because of the pandemic, we did put the program on pause. But during this time, we did conduct some surveys with the employees that were involved with the pilot program to gauge program satisfaction and to better understand where the gaps were in the education and understanding. So if you could click. Um, one of our questions was just around the overall satisfaction and we found that people were generally pretty happy, middle ground. And then next, our highest concern was around odors. Next slide. Finally, um, as you can recall, we didn't have a whole lot of garbage in our bins, even though we were emptying them every day. So while we were implementing this organics and recycling program, we anticipated that our individual garbage can use would be reduced even further. So the time and effort for the caretaking staff to enter each person's office to essentially empty one piece of garbage out of everybody's bins seemed like a waste. So we asked pilot program people if they would be willing to forfeit their individual garbage can. And you can see that it was pretty divided and the reasons behind people voting no were on the next slide. Um, they would still have some materials that would not fit in the compostable or recyclable stream. They felt that walking to a communal garbage is not an efficient use of time. And first and foremost, everyone just thought it would be inconvenient to not have one in their office. So next slide. We decided to kind of compromise. So in the later part of the pandemic, we replaced office garbage cans with the hanging basket series. And just inform the employees of the pilot program that their waste would still be co collected by caretaking staff for the time being, but that was going to change come January of 2023. So we provided everybody with a large recycling bin, a small organics basket, and a small garbage basket. And this would allow people to separate their waste in the comfort of their office while maintaining this convenience factor. We provided every person with this uh, postcard on the screen explaining the purpose of the change. And um, luckily, we did this when most people were working from home, so we didn't really meet much resistance. Essentially, when people came back to the office, their bin configuration was just changed, so they didn't really protest. Next slide. The organics program was officially reinstated in 2022 when people started coming back to the office. And because of this gray area in time, this um, full rollout of our corporate organics program was aligning well with our residential curbside organics. So again, this made our education easier as the ins and outs of our program were the same. 
So it was my responsibility. This is kind of when I came onto this city. I've been here since 2022. Um, so I helped equip our city facilities with a four stream waste system um, in compliance with our bylaw. Next slide. So some details around how I did that. I visited every facility individually to talk to the office managers and the staff about what the program entailed. I delivered the indoor and outdoor waste bins and helped coordinate the schedules for collection. And to ensure that the, there is equal convenience for organics, um, we did just add it to our centralized stations in the lunchroom and coffee areas, as well as the paper towel only bins that were um, provided in the applicable bathrooms. We also felt that it was a good time to fully integrate the recycling and organic scope to our existing caretaking contract. So we finally built in the requirements for 13 of our facilities. So now the caretaking staff is um, responsible for servicing all of the bins. They ensure that the bins are clean and they also supply all of the bags, including the organics paper liners that are in the bins. So facilities that were outside of this larger caretaking contract are responsible for sorting out this caretaking requirements on their own. So one of my favorite uh, examples is our fire halls. So our fire and EMS staff are responsible for all of their cleaning and caretaking sc scope within their buildings. So the inclusion of the organics was communicated with the staff and training was provided. Um, we didn't really receive much pushback from these internal departments, even if they had uh, additional caretaking scope that was part of the change. So overall a positive experience there. Finally, we had a robust communication strategy for this program. So I communicated directly with department managers to disseminate the information to their staff and did presentations at team meetings. Clear signage is provided for each bin to clarify the ins and outs and these signs are consistent among all facilities. We had an FAQ developed. Um, we had information passed through our internal newsletter. And my colleague Felipe, who I mentioned before, also created instructional videos um, that are used for our community-wide rollout as well. So these were used to educate our staff as well. Next slide. The remaining of our city facilities with office space had their garbage cans swapped for the hanging basket series as well. So this did help save on caretaking costs. So our caretakers no longer go into every individual office to empty bins. Every employee is responsible to take their individual baskets and dump them in the centralized location. And this started in January. So because people were in the office this time around, we did get some pushback. There are some people that are just very connected to their garbage bin and just did not wanna give it up. So we were lucky because this direction actually came down from our city manager. So we had the support from our executive leadership team to have this scope removed from the caretaking contract. And ever since the change has actually been made, I haven't heard of any complaints related to emptying the personal waste baskets. It was just the act of taking away people's garbage cans that they weren't exactly thrilled about. So I don't have exact economic savings for changing this caretaking scope just because a lot of our contracts are based on square footage of the buildings, but it um, is in the order of magnitude of about $600 per month about our 11 facilities that had their garbage scope removed. Um, next slide. So this is where we are today. So we have our 45 facilities with our uh, waste collection system. Next slide. For our next steps, we did do another waste audit in 2019 or 2020 to look at where we're at. Um, obviously, we still have some work to do. We do also tra track the tonnage of recyclables and organics that are collected from our city facilities. So you can see that in 2023, we've had a substantially large increase in our organic materials. So that's awesome. And the weight of our mixed recycling has remained pretty steady from project implementation. So to help with 
help, uh, diverting more of these materials from our garbage, we are going to contact the facility managers again just to assess the success of the program after the full year of implementation. So come January 2024, ongoing education is absolutely critical. And we do have mandatory training that is required for all of our employees. We will continue completing waste audits to determine our potential diversion opportunities. And I think it's always important to highlight success stories. So sharing things like our fire and EMS staff with the, the larger city of Lethbridge population, I think is awesome. Um, next slide. A lot of my tips and tricks are pretty similar to Joni's. Um, I think the economic benefit of diverting waste is always a home run. So the tipping fee for garbage is larger than recycling organics. Plus we have this additional um, surcharge for non-compliance. So we need to walk the talk here. Removing the individual office waste collection can save on caretaking costs and Providing people with the smaller garbage bin itself can also encourage diversion. And then also clear signage and consistent bin types across the whole organization helps with program understanding. So I absolutely would encourage you all to be leaders when it comes to waste diversion. And especially if you work in a public sector or municipality, you're often looked at uh, for paving the way and demonstrating how this can be done. And it's not complicated and it's, it, it's important to do. So that is everything I have. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I am looking forward to some questions. Great, thank you, Brain. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, you, you touched on many of the best practices when just with, uh, on the, the narrow issue of, of how do you get people to buy into it? Um, that there are a couple of things that stood out that you mentioned. Um, um, you know, you're doing the survey, I thought was interesting. Uh, but you, one of the things I found is that if nothing else, people who don't like a change at least want to feel like they're being heard. Um, and then what way that you can sort of siphon off or blow off some of the steam that you might get from folks is, is showing that you are listening um, and you're incorporating their ideas. I've, I've seen that with other facilities where you, you do the pilot, you solicit feedback and you make a very almost ostentatious effort to highlight how we got this idea from this person. And so now we're gonna do this. Those are all kind of some of those those pro tips for how you you um, you peel off folks um, uh, who, who might otherwise be the ones who are vocal complaining mm -hmm. about system. Um, <laughs> Um, also, I think it, it, you know, the fact that you're able to get your leadership to, um, you know, the memo came out from them, I think is, is also really important. Um, and that goes to one question that had come in. Um, as far as, you know, were you requiring, were, were leadership, um, the city manager, were others required to do this themselves in their own offices? Um, I'm curious um, what the case was there. Yes, we did have some conversations about keeping garbage collection in our executive executive leadership team as well as our council members who have offices within city hall but ultimately their garbage collection scope was also removed so they don't have garbage cans they have the hanging waste basket series um, and they don't have caretaking scope within their offices so everybody's the same excellent good um, let's go ahead and transition to questions. Jenny, if you want to turn your camera on too, um, some of these are, are specific to individuals, but many of these I think are universal. So either one of you could uh, respond to them. Um, uh, so looking for some questions here. Let's start with just one about organics, um, collecting organics. Um, several folks threw a questions about odors and managing that, um, the observation that, you know, are you emptying the bins, the centralized bins? every single day to manage that? If not, um, are there other tips for how you avoid odors and, and issues? I can start, that works. Okay. Um, in our individual offices, because it is on your, um, it's your owner's to task to take it to the recycling or centralized collection system. Um, I haven't heard of many people saying that there's any problems with odors inside their individual offices. For our centralized system, um, one thing I often communicate with people is that the same material that would go in your garbage bin would 
just be in the bin right next to it in the organics. So there isn't necessarily odors that are magically appearing because of the organics bin itself. So I think that's important to say. And then if we do have a situation where we have maybe like fruit flies or other pests that are introduced, we just remove the organics bin from that location for about a week and just put it outside. And then by the time we reintroduce it, um, all of the pests seem to be gone. But as for collection, at least in our city facilities, we have it twice a week, so not daily. Okay. Yeah, and I would echo um, the sentiment that it's the same waste. This is one of my pet peeves um, when I, that, you know, people, even when I do waste audits and I have to set aside waste for a day and they're like, ooh, pests. And it's like, well, it's it's already there. We're just putting it in a different, you know, so that that's a real kind of misconception um with with the organic waste and um and but but similar you know there are certain locations that are just not conducive or that it can attract more pests and you just have to be a little bit more flexible or be, be nimble in terms of adapting to those individual minor situations yeah i, I i've seen one example of uh, the creative work around um uh university at least as they were implementing organic collection, they were actually placing bins and restrooms where they simultaneously had a paper towel collection. Um, and they found that a people's expectations around odors were more lenient as it were in, in that, that setting. Um, and that the paper towels <laughs> created that source of carbon that also helped to dry up heat material. That, that, that was at least early on when they were still trying to get buy-in to, to mm -hmm. implement um, when they were facing resistance initially. Um, Good. Um, uh, another the question more for you, Rain, but um, with uh, the waste audits you did, were those, uh, was that done in-house or were you hiring a contractor to do those? We do hire a consultant to complete our waste audits, yeah. Got it. I know in, in a lot of Canadian provinces, there's there's a mandate for large institutions to have to do audits on an annual basis. Um, is that the case with, with Lethbridge? Um, I'm not actually sure, to be completely honest, but probably. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we, I and just I want to acknowledge we're, we're at the hour. Um, we're, let's do another, maybe another five or six minutes worth of questions, and then I'll have some closing slides. But for both those who are um, okay sticking on, uh, we do have some more questions. Um, um, the question for you, Joni, around uh, the custodial, you mentioned that um, your your custodial is all done with a contracted service provider. I'm curious, um, I've heard other examples where that having that degree of separation between the folks who are trying to implement and manage the waste reduction um, when you have to go through a third party, have you found that that is an issue in terms of keeping the contracted staff trained and understanding the system and how you work with them to make sure that you know, the system actually gets followed? Great question, because not only is there one, but there are two layers of um, contracting. So our custodial services are subcontracted to our facilities management contractor. Um, but that said, we have a fantastic relationship. I have a dedicated sustainability manager with that custodial services team. She does a fantastic job. I mean, I literally have a meeting with that team following this meeting where the, you know, we, we, the communication lines are open and they, you know, they, as a company, just know how important it is for us to, you know, for these programs, you know, that, you know, like I mentioned, our 2020 sustainability plan is, is it's across our organization. It's not just people like me, the environmental people who are doing it, what the expectation is on all of our service providers and our C-suite, um, as well as the people on the ground that we're all working on this together. So, yeah. So, um, I, I, I found in general, having the strategy to, to make sure the custodians, whether it's in-house or if it's contracted, having that, that, that regular relationship mm -hmm. and you know, listening to them and, you know, actually going and, and consulting with them. They, they are the eyes and the ears on the ground yeah, in many yeah. cases and can be a real key to success. And oftentimes they, they don't feel heard. And so I think yeah. just even showing that you're, you're making the effort um, can really go a long ways towards uh, making them. Yeah. Allies. And, you know, now that you say that, uh, you know, I did point out they were going ahead and emptying those bins that people had 
you know, somehow found someplace and just were leaving outside their, their office. And, you know, so it's, you know, sometimes we do need to kind of say, Hey guys, you know, I know you're trying to just be service providers, but you gotta, you know, not do that. Another example is, you know, sometimes I'll bump into people and I'll say, there's, you know, there's four containers at that location upstairs. Why? And they'll be like, yeah, you know, we saw that we don't, there's too many containers. And I'm like, speak up. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes we do need to really encourage because like you say, they, they are the, the boots on the ground or the eyes and ears. And I want them to be telling me, I can't be, you know, in all those locations like they, like they can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. A question that came in for you specifically was, um, were the recycling captains in your facility staff um, uh, from across departments and functions or was it run, being run by housekeeping operations staff? Yeah, they were just regular staff across all of our departments. So um, before we had an official sustainability group within the city itself, we had a corporate sustainability initiative and people from all across the organization were part of this initiative. And I think this was before my time, but from what I understand, many of these recycling captains were kind of born from this initiative. But yeah, they weren't um, specifically operations or custodial. They were just, um, just like you and I. <laughs> yep. Uh, I've, I've seen where um, examples where it's, you may not be able to get the support to actually implement the system across the board, but but um, as sort of an interim beginning step is starting with just volunteers. You get individual staff folks who are willing to do that and you make them your sort of the, um, you use them to help build the case study and make, you know, get testimonials from them of we did it, the, the sky didn't fall. Um, I, you would see them having little little badges, things that can go on their, their door, something that acknowledges they're a part of a green team. Um, it's a good strategy for, for uh, implementing programs. Um, I, here's, I, I, this is a good question from Kate. This is just sort of a general one, but for either one of you, what are, what are some of the other barriers, things that can go wrong? We, we talked about pushback from, from individual staff members, but are there other pitfalls that you can point to that um, the folks should be cautious of as they're approaching something like this? I mean, an, an anecdote, it, it didn't actually happen to us, but I was speaking with someone else at a university where um, a professor actually put together what, what amounted to act, almost a thesis of saying, you know, here's the amount of time that it will take me to empty my garbage can and here's how much you're paying me. And, and you know, you'll get those, and, and, but, it, but it, you know, like I mentioned the vocal minority, it, it caught attention and it, it, you know, sometimes those things can kind of snowball. Um, so kind of going back to how I said that, you know, one person found a trash can and other people start to do it. It's just like when you look in a recycling bin that has the wrong thing in it and someone sees that and then they start putting the wrong thing in it too, you know. So that that kind of group think or herd mentality can be problematic. You know, I think um, my understanding is with our rollout, there were some either buildings or areas that were harder than others. And I can only assume that's because, again, the churn within that that area, conversely, the, the buildings that were easy, you probably had a lot of people kind of champion it. And, you know, the people that didn't really like it weren't going to, you know, make make as much noise. So I think those are a common pitfall with this kind of a program. Yeah. Uh... Brynn, did you have, do you have some, something to add to that? Yeah, and it kind of um, is related to another question that I saw in the Q&A. So one thing that we have come across since starting this, is particularly taking away people's garbage cans, is that we do kind of have this stranded asset, right? So now that we've replaced their individual cans with these hanging baskets and like the larger recycling bin, we do have um, a, a pretty large stack of old garbage cans in one of our storage rooms. So we have been going through them and recycling the ones that are broken and donating some to our local thrift stores for uh, the bins that are usable. But um, if anyone has any creative ideas for how to repurpose these, I would love to hear them because uh, yeah, I think some of our donation centers are or at capacity when it comes to the individual garbage bins. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I've definitely seen um, oftentimes elementary schools are really excited to get free bins. Um, and, um, and, and I know some areas, regions will have material exchange uh, exchanges that are set up. So on an institutional level, if you have a large volume of, of whatever that is, um, it's a good way of, of um, um, offloading old bins that you're not using. Yeah. The, um, I had another thought, but I lost it. So we're, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep moving on. Um, um, there, there was a question a few, a little while back about that um, bag liners. Um, and types of liners being used. And the, I think the question was specifically to you, Joni, but um, do you, in, in the other case, are there um, specific types of liners that you use for different streams or color coding or how do you do that? Yeah, absolutely color coded. Um, so black is trash, blue is recycling, and then we actually have clear for compost or semi-transparent, but the reason why they're more expensive is because it is a thicker gauge. Those compostables are generally heavier um, and leakier. Um, and so we always do a, a, a heavier gauge on those. Um, but the color coding is really important. And that's just really the first step. Again, our custodial services team is just so um, fantastic. And, and we keep the, the recycling and compost bags some transparent so that they can see. And if they see a huge amount of contamination, they won't put it in the recycling or compost compactor, they'll go ahead and trash it because they don't want to contribute to the comp to the to the contamination issue. So um, yeah, that's a, a real important aspect of it. We can't we don't have compostable actual bag quote unquote compostable um, bags. Our our hauler doesn't accept any um, uh, quote unquote bioplastics, um, but they do have bag rippers. So they just said you know we'll you can you can bag your compostables for us. Um, I don't think you can for the the residential areas in our neighborhood or in our yeah, area. Got it. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly found also just in terms of especially where you have um, custodial where you have high turnover, um, the same logic of having sort of a uniform branded system front of house can also be really important on the back of house. Um, the, yep. You know, even having the dumpsters colored the same, you know, blue for recycling, so that there's there's no question of it goes from here to here to here um, without even having to get into the, the training and, and that piece. Um, well, and the state of California has made the blue, green, black color coding system for bins um, across the, the whole state. So it, it aligned perfectly with our program that, you know, we our color scheme predated the state mandate, but it's kind of consistent with what everyone does and like with the Recycle Across America platform. So it works well. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, let's see if we can do. Um, let's, let's take one more question um, before we wrap up. Um, and, and actually, the, the, this one I'll step back to sort of broader post pandemic because um, you know the world has changed. Obviously, a lot of what we're talking about are models that that were put in place. Uh, before the pandemic that have worked. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, is, is are there is there anything since the pandemic has been implemented and with the hybrid work situations that um, that you find is affecting how the collections work? If there are fewer people who are actually in the office, the lower volume, is, is that changed any of the operational considerations? And I maybe this is more for you, Joni, since I know Rain, your your program has effectively been put in place since then, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know Rain kind of mentioned it was kind of easier to do, you know, kind of slip it in while people were out, which is great. Um, I think the biggest impact of the pandemic is, I mean, we we have just far fewer people on site even today. We're trying to bring people back, but we still have a very much a hybrid model. And so it kind of goes to that, you know, all this legacy equipment um, areas. I mean, we, we literally have like shut down buildings and, you know, all of that you know, those extra bins are, are just sitting or I've gotten rid of them or, you know, we're maintaining some of them. But, um, you know, because the program is so old, you know, has forever been in place, it, you know, the pandemic didn't really have any big effect overall in that and this aspect of our programs. Um, yeah. I, I mean, aside from the obvious, you know, when people felt like, like for some reason you could not reuse anything and everything became disposable for a while. Um, but that's aside, it had nothing to do with how, you know, how we collect the waste really. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, th there was a question in here that that went to uh, you know, an aspect of, of what what you moved to, Joni, with in many cases uh, where, where you have the hoteling system where, where folks don't have an assigned desk or office anymore. They just, if they're only coming in one or two days a week and they're not in an assigned place, how do you, who takes, you know, if you, the custodian is not emptying it, then who actually takes responsibility for it if it's not your space? You're just there for, you know, for for a couple hours or or, or for the day. Um, well, we've, we've, I mean, completely gotten rid of any, you know, sort of individual responsibility bins at all. So it's all yeah. centralized. So the custodians are are empty and there's no, you know, back in the day, like if there still was an area, like, for example, like I said, they'd maintain the paper recycling box in, um, you know, a shared office space that had four, four people in kind of a, a closed off, it was still closed off office. You know, they just kind of had to duke it out and decide who took it out, you know, and, and there is that obvious, you know, it's kind of like when the, the printer breaks and nobody, re you know, everyone else thinks somebody else reports it. There would be times when, you know, things might get overfilled, um, but overall, like I say, right now, it's just, it's all centralized. So that's not become a non-issue. And that's another thing, you know, when we heard about pests is one of the arguments for doing this is the people who do eat bananas at their desk. And then it sits there because you do only have maybe a weekly office service or something. It's much harder to monitor those situations um, when you've got got these bins scattered all over the place versus a few select central locations that are regularly being tracked. Uh, tracked and, and monitored so that's another um, reason for it yeah yeah that that, that, that makes sense um look, we're going to go ahead and cap it here we, we do have some other questions that have come in um we will uh do our best to respond to some of these offline but um but i do appreciate everybody who submitted questions today um i do have a couple closing slides i want to come back to real quick um I uh, just want to point out that uh, we do, um, this is our last program for 2023. Um, we, we are already looking forward to 2024. Uh, and um, just do a quick teaser here. Our first program will be focused on healthcare waste reduction and diversion. Uh, we don't have a date set for that yet, but, um, but we will in the near future. So look for more information regarding this in the uh, near future. I um, want to point out that we have uh, the recording as well as the presentation slides uh, from today's program will be posted online uh, within the next day or so. We'll be sending out an email to everybody who registered to help you uh, um, access those if you want to come back and watch them again or, or share them with a colleague. Um, also point out there are, um, I, I have a blog series that I do um, on many of these best practice kinds of programs. And we have topics that I've done um, over the last few years around implementing centralized collections, as well as some of uh, the, the other um, aspects of how you professionalize office programs that I referred to. Um, things like uh, research showing that how putting signs above bins can help to improve contamination um, um, and uh, the benefits of creating uniform bid standards, et cetera. You can find these and other blog topics on our website if you go to that bushsystems.com uh, backslash blog, and then um, you can find from there the the link to uh, the Advancing Recycling is the name of the series that I do in particular. Um, also, want to point out we do have, uh, in addition to today's program, we have uh, a whole uh, slew of programs over the last two three years that we've done on various topics with many other case studies. Um, so um, you can find recordings and slide decks for those as well on our road on, on our website. If you go to the same link. Um, and then I want to do a shout out. To, this is um, uh, this is a, a, a virtual conference coming up in December that I'm involved with, and the Bush Systems is also a, a sponsor. So I just want to acknowledge the Virtual National Recycling Congress that will be on December 5th and 6th. Um, this is going to be looking at a whole range of topics, um, both recycling, but also uh, waste prevention, reuse, um, uh, and a whole broad range of industry. Uh, program. So if um, if you're looking for, um, you know, tapping into some of that, the knowledge of what's out there on a national level in the recycling industry, we'll have a lot of industry leaders participating with this um, and the, the benefit of not having to travel and all the costs across the country for a national conference. So I um, encourage folks to check out this conference coming up in December. Um, and with that, I want to thank uh, Joni and Rain. Thank you both for taking the time to uh, put together presentations and participate. We we really appreciate um, everything you contributed to the program today. So.
That's great. So thank, thank you. you Jody. Absolutely. Um, Thanks very much. And that brings us to the end of the program. Um, Typically, we we do a product demo at the end of the program. So we're not going going to to today. We're just going to end it off here. But obviously, um, uh, I'll just reinforce that Bush Systems is uh, we are a manufacturer of fine recycling and waste bins, and we have lots of great products. And uh, we encourage folks who are interested to reach out. Um, you can find uh, a, you know the full range of of uh, bins we do for different settings um, on our website at bushsystems.com. Um, and last thing, just want to point out that we will have a survey that will go out after the program, um, and we'd love getting your feedback. If you wouldn't mind just taking, uh, you know, 60 seconds to follow up to the three or four questions that we have um, to share with our speakers, um, we do appreciate that. And otherwise, thank you for joining us today and look for announcements about our next program um, over the next month, and we will see you down the road. Goodbye.